Hi there, welcome to the Schwoven's Nest. My name is Sandra, and I'm so glad you're here. For this DIY, I'm using this artist's panel that you can get at dollar stores. You can also get different sizes at craft stores and on Amazon. I'm just going to use some brown acrylic paint and I'm going to apply it like it was a stain. So I'm just going to put it all the way around the back and then I'm going to wrap it around the front and make it look like a framed picture. I did two panels with the brown and then two panels just with some white chalk paint. Now I'm going to use a glue stick and just apply the design that I printed off on white cardstock. I've got a few different designs here. I'm making four of these all together because they are going to be part of my collection at Finnegan's General Store. And I'll tell you more about their store in a few minutes. When you're using a glue stick, if you put enough on the back, it gives you a little bit of time that you can adjust your photo or your print or whatever you're putting inside. I'm just using my Cricut little squeegee scraper here to make sure that I have all of the edges and everything glued down really well. I will be giving this a coat of spray sealer when I'm done with the project just to make sure that nothing comes apart. Of course, I'm going to need to distress the white one because that makes it look more old and weathered and more farmhouse. So I'm just using a chip brush and just a little bit of black paint, not too much. I offloaded quite a bit of it and I just want to get a little bit of a color on here, not too heavy. Next for the signs, I need to drill a partial hole in the center of the bottom of them. So I'm just using my drill here and I'm just going to go in about a quarter of an inch and that is going to fit the dowel that I've created on the spindle. I cut some spindles down to about seven or eight inches and I'm going to drill a hole in the center of it because I'm going to need to fit the dowel in the hole which I'll be able to then attach to the picture. I grabbed some pieces of scrap wood to use as the base of the spindle and I'm going to start the screw and make sure that it goes in a little bit so I can easily find the hole and then I'll attach these two pieces together. I used my weld bond glue to glue the dowel into the spindle and let that set for a couple of hours before I moved on to this step. I'm also going to be using some of my weld bond glue to make sure that this stays in place and I'm going to use a little bit of hot glue just to make it secure while the weld bond glue sets up. And these turned out so pretty. I made four of these all together and they're now being displayed at Finnegan's General Store and they are for sale there. With spring and summer fast approaching, I thought it would be really nice to make a wreath that you could display all through the spring and summer season right into the fall. I've got some of these sunflowers. They're really big. I picked them up at Dollarama, but I think they were a clearance item from a different store because I've never seen any of them since and they're such high quality blooms. I'm gonna remove the stems because I wanna just use that little knob that's left and just put some hot glue on it and wedge it right in between the grapevine branches. So this wreath did some evolving as I was working with it. I did put the third blossom down at the bottom there, but later on I'm going to be pulling that off and rejigging it. I'm going to be using some of these ficus leaves. I'm going to glue them in all around the blossoms and then going up the one side and then around the other side. I did also trim some of the ficus leaves down because a couple of them were actually quite a few of them were kind of sticking out in a funny way and I just didn't like the look of it. So when you're working with florals like this, don't be afraid to just move things around or trim different branches off and place them in a different area. You want to make sure that you love it. If you don't love it, you're not going to hang it. Once I was done adding the ficus leaves, I felt that it was too flat. Ficus leaves aren't my very favorite to work with, but I had already put them on there, so I just decided to keep going. I'm going to add some of these other little greeneries that are really more textured and they have a little bit of white on their tips, and I think that made a huge difference. 
Then once I had those first couple of stems stuck in, I didn't like that they were so bulky. So I removed the individual stems and I'm just going to hot glue them in places all the way around. And that just gives it more of a delicate texture. If you are new to my channel, welcome. I'm so glad you stopped by. If you like what you see, I would love it if you could hit that red subscribe button and stick around a while. It really helps support the growth of my channel and I truly appreciate it. Thank you to all of my current viewers and subscribers. I love you guys and I really appreciate each and every one of you too. Now I'm going to show you how I made the little bee that was on the wreath. I'm using just some air dry clay and I picked this up at Dollarama, which is a local dollar store. It was $4 for a big chunk and it works really, really well. So what I'm doing now is just creating sort of an egg shape to create the body. Then I'm going to use another little bit of clay, make a little round head and then attach the two together. With this air dry clay, it's really good to have every everything connected together first and then let it dry all together. If you want to have a really more secure hold, you can definitely glue the pieces together, but you can also just use a little bit of water to hold them in place. I flattened it out just a little bit because he was kind of chunky and I'm going to be adding some wings so I need more of a flat surface to apply the wings. I took another smaller piece and made a circle shape and then I just squished it flat with my hands and then shaped it how I wanted it to be. Now I'm just going to trim off a little bit of it because I thought it was a little big, make it more of an oval shape and then add it onto the B. I'm going to repeat this process for the other wing and then I'm going to make two other smaller ones and have those layered on top of the original wings. I used my fingers just to flatten out the ridge that was attached to the body, blending those two pieces of clay together and that held it in place really well. I let my bead dry overnight and now I'm just using some of my paints and I'm going to paint the little head black. I'm going to give him some yellow stripes of course and then I'm going to paint the wings white. Just a quick note for you, just because this is what I found out, is if you paint the clay and then apply the glue, the glue only sticks to the paint and not the clay. So don't paint the part that you want to glue. I ended up having to pull him off because he was kind of hanging the next day and I removed all of the paint and then re-glued him. But he turned out pretty cute. I have had this adorable little chair sitting in my closet for probably almost a year now and I decided it was time to get it out. I'm going to decorate it for spring and I'm going to make it look farmhouse cute. So the first thing I'm doing, of course, as always, is using my Rust-Oleum Linen White Chalk Paint and I'm using my Bennett Chalk Paint Brush and I'm going to give it two coats. I picked this up at a thrift store for $1.99. I did like the muted yellow color that it was already, but seeing as I'm into the white with farmhouse, once I distress it though, it's going to look really cool with the yellow peeking through. Now that the paint is dry, I'm going to go ahead and take some 220 grit sandpaper and sand the edges, some of the spindles on the legs, anywhere where I think it would be worn off from regular use. Then I'll dress it up for spring.
this next project is half of this thrifted item. I got two of these for $2.99 at the thrift store and it shows at the back here that you can put some pictures in if you want. It didn't come with any backing so what I'm going to do is something a little bit different. The first step of course is Rust-Oleum chalk paint in linen white. Two coats front and back. I'm going to give this a shiplap look. So I found these contractor shims at Home Depot. There's a stack of them. There's a bunch of them that come in this package. They're really long. They do go thicker at one end to thinner at the other end, which makes it really easy to be able to cut it without a saw. I was able to just use my craft knife. Each picture frame area was going to hold three of them in width. I needed them to be just under six inches long. So I'm just gonna go ahead and mark out six inches. I got two six inch pieces out of each of these little pieces of wood, and then I'll be able to fit them in nicely. What I ended up doing was taking my craft knife and scoring it a few different times and then just snapping them. For the thicker parts, which I'm doing right now, I had to score on either side of it, but then I was able to snap it in half and then just clean up the edges with my craft knife. Here I've got all the pieces of wood just laying in to make sure that they fit and I'm just gonna use some hot glue at either end and glue them in. I'm going to paint them white which will give them a shiplap look and of course I'm using my white linen chalk paint. I thought it would be really cute to use this stencil that was a Hobby Lobby buy for $2.99 and I'm going to put the chicken up at the top, the pig in the middle and the cow down at the bottom. It's hard to see, sorry for the glare, but I'm just going to be using my pencil and trace these out because it's not a flat surface and I don't wanna cut the stencils to make them fit in there. So I'm just gonna do my best to press it in place and then trace it out. When I got down to doing the cow, the cow itself was big enough to fit right in that space and I didn't have any extra area to put the words moo. So I decided to do something a little different with this one and put the words moo right inside the cow. I placed the words in the middle of the cow's belly and traced them out. I'm going to use my Craft Smart oil based pens. I'm going to start using the fine tip for the lettering, and then I'll be going through and coloring in the stenciled animals. While I was doing this coloring in, I decided to leave some little bits of white peeking through. That gave it more of a weathered look and more aged and rustic, and I really liked how it was turning out. Here's where things get a little bit different. You can see for the chicken and the pig, I've colored everything black, but for the cow, because I put the letters on the inside, I have to do things a little bit differently. So what I'm going to do is take my pen and just go around the exterior of my pencil lines so these letters stay white and don't get filled in black. As I'm going through the letters, anything that will be on the background, so in the letters of O, there's a little bit that is going to actually be the background peeking through. I'm gonna go ahead and fill that in, but everything else is gonna stay white. Once that's done, I just colored the rest of the cow in. The last thing I'm doing to this sign, which I think is turning out so adorable, is just giving it a bit of an enamel look. So I'm taking the large tip marker and going around the inside of the frame 
pictures and also the exterior of the frame. And I'm not doing a solid line, I'm leaving some white spaces in between so it looks more natural. The last project that I have for you today is this bread box. It was $5.99 at a thrift store. You could have it open traditionally where the door folds down in the front, but I'm gonna flip it and have the door open at the top because there's a nice portion of smooth wood at the front side where I'll be able to put some additional embellishments. If you've been following me on YouTube, you'll know that the prep is the most important part. I did need to take some sandpaper and sand off just the top of this, which is actually the door. And it had some icky things on it. It had some varnish that was peeling off. So I just wanted it to have a nice smooth surface. I was debating on what color I should paint this bread box, but I came back to my go-to paint, which is the Rust-Oleum chalk paint in linen white. You guessed it, that's the one. And I'm just gonna give it all two coats. I was dabbling with the thought of maybe painting it a light gray and then doing some embellishments in the white, but I just really like how clean and beautiful things look when they're painted white and you use black or gray decorations on it. I would love to know your thoughts on this, whether you're a white person like me or you like more color. If you're into the grays or browns, let me know what you think you would have done with this bread box. I'm curious to know. This is the area of the bread box that will be the front. And I've got these stencils that I picked up at Joanne Fabrics when I was visiting the States a while ago. And I decided to do the farm fresh market or farmer's market stencil. So I'm gonna take that off and I'm just gonna use the farmer's market words and the little embellishment on the top. I've taped it down in a couple spots using some painter's tape and I've just made sure that the original white is really nice and dry. And now I'm just taking my Dollar Tree stencil brush and a dark country gray chalk paint and stenciling in. I'm not doing it really dark or really thick. I want it to be kind of aged and weathered. So I'm just gonna do my best not to fill it in too much. I want some of that white to be able to peek through. I just can't get enough of this reveal. Just taking that stencil off is amazing. And I know I say it in almost every one of my videos, but it's so true. I still get really, really excited to see the results. I had already washed the stencil when I decided to put that little embellishment, just those two lines and that little scroll kind of design on the top of the bread box, which is actually the door. Now I have three more spindles that are a little bit longer and this wood round that I picked up at my local Dollarama, it was a sign. I sanded the paper off as much as I needed to. And now I'm going to use the same glue to pre-glue these in place. And I let them set for a good hour before I did anything else with them. Once I was able to flip it over without the little legs falling off, I used my nailer to hold it in place. Now, if you don't have a nailer, you could definitely pre-drill some holes and just add a screw. Make sure that you sink it below the level of the wood circle because then you can just add a little bit of wood filler or some spackle and smooth out the top. So I'm back inside now and this is what this stand or stool or whatever you want to call it, little mini table, looks like upside down with the spindles on. I am using some black paint and this is Folk Art 
multi-surface paint. It's just what I happen to have on hand. It covers really, really well, but it doesn't stick to slick surfaces very well. So later on, it when you see me working with this paint and another project, you're gonna see some of the paint kind of come off the spindles because they still, of course, have all their varnish. But for this project, it's perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and paint the whole thing, top and bottom, in black. Originally, I thought I was going to paint it all white and then distress it back to the black and some of the brown on the spindles, but I decided to change things up and I'm just going to be painting the very top of this white. So in hindsight, I didn't need to paint the top of it black, but oh well, that's how it happens when you're crafting. Your mind kind of changes as you go. Once the paint was completely dry again, I am using a stencil for this. This is a French script stencil with some type of stamp on it, and I picked it up on Amazon. If I can find it again, I will link it for you down in my description box. And again, I'm just using a makeup sponge and some black paint, and I'm going to go ahead and stencil the whole thing on. And I think this turned out absolutely gorgeous. I really love this one. I found this beautiful basket at the thrift store for $2.99, so I'm going to put some little spindle feet on it. I'm going to use the same Gorilla Glue, but this time I'm going to add hot glue so I can have an opportunity for the Gorilla Glue to set up, and using hot glue on a basket like this is the perfect combination. So just a blob in the center will hold it in place, and I'm going to just set it aside to dry. I did end up taking this out to my garage and pinning it with my nailer after everything was all said and done, simply because the bottom of this basket is kind of flimsy, so they were a little wobbly and I just wanted to, them to be a little bit more secure. I wanted the feet to have a little bit of a darker color, so I'm using my folk art antiquing wax and I'm going to just paint it on and set it aside to dry. Now, when you're using antique wax just like this, it does take a couple of days for it to fully dry, so just be aware of that if you're using this type of technique. I love how this basket turned out and I think it looks really pretty with some of these florals in it. I found this beautiful hummingbird. I think it's supposed to be some type of feeder that you would hang on your wall. It's super heavy and I think it's made out of concrete, I think. Anyway, it's just really heavy. What I'm doing here is adding some Gorilla Glue and some hot glue to a chunky spindle that I already attached to a wood round. And now I'm going to just let this set and cure for at least a couple of hours before I touch it again. Here's what it looks like all put together. And I decided to try and mimic the same kind of colors and tones of the hummingbird little stand there. So I'm gonna start by painting the bottom portion gray. This is sort of a medium toned gray and I could already tell by putting this on that it was really not the same shade of gray or even the tone. My color is a little bit more blue and the other one is a little bit more I don't know what you would call it. But anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and finish painting this up and then use some different colors to dry brush and make it look a little bit similar. I'm starting out with some white paint just to lighten it up a little bit. And I'm going to go up the spindle portion as well. Then I decided to use a little bit of a green eucalyptus kind of color. This does have a little bit of a green tone to it. So adding that color kind of made it blend in a little bit better. 
The last thing I did was just add a little bit more of the gray. Some of the green went on a little heavier than I wanted, so I'm just blending it all in a little bit more. I think this turned out absolutely gorgeous and it is a beautiful piece just to display just as is. Here's a quick picture of the Gorilla Glue that I'm using. It's called Clear Grip. I'm going to be, of course, creating some candlesticks. I don't think any spindle video would be complete without some type of candlesticks. I'm going to go ahead and take these chunky white ones with some of the Gorilla Glue and just put them onto these four by fours. These are two by fours cut in four inch by four inch pieces. I found a pack of these saucers. I'm not sure what they would have been used for, probably little appetizer dishes, but I'm going to go ahead and glue those to the top of this candlestick. And that will be the holder for either a candle or a floral arrangement or whatever you want to put on the top. This pair of candlesticks is going to stay white, but I did need to give the already painted portion at least one coat because my color of white was a little bit different than what was already on the spindle. So just one full coat with some chalk paint, it gives it really good coverage, especially on that raw wood. For this pair of candlesticks, I'm going to be using some rounds and these I got at Michael's. So these are just the plain ones, but I have seen these at the Dollar Tree sometimes. Mine just don't happen to be carrying them anymore. These smaller ones have a little bit of a mitered or beveled edge. I'm not sure what you would call that. I'm going to glue those two together and that's just going to make a nice bottom piece for the spindle. Again, I'm just using the glue and then I'm going to use my nailer to nail everything together. I painted these black using the same folk art multi-surface paint. It is in a satin finish. It's the only finish it's available in. So you can see a little bit of shine happen in there. I'm okay with that because I'm going to be going and putting this antiquing wax on top of it and then wiping off the excess. That will dull the shine down a little bit and it will also give it a beautiful old and deep rich black look. When it came to doing the spindle portion, I did get a little bit of the black paint coming off when I was wiping off the antiquing wax. I'm okay with that because I thought it gave it more of a rustic look, but if you would prefer to have the solid black underneath, then I would suggest you sealing it first before you put the antique wax. You could do that with some clear wax or some matte clear spray, whatever you happen to have on hand. But I really love how this turned out. I grabbed a couple of these milk jugs from the thrift store for $3.99 a piece. I'm going to be making over the one on the left. The first thing I did was take them out to my garage and give them a couple of coats of spray paint. Then I gave them a couple of coats of white chalk paint. And now I have the perfect canvas to create something fun. I'm using my favorite way to transfer images and that is printing off on tissue paper. Right now I'm just applying a thin layer of Mod Podge all where I think the label is going to go and then I'll just apply the label. I like to pick up my image with my paintbrush as you saw me do there. It just makes it easier to hang on to a project so you can see it and I'll be able to just place it where I need it to be. I'll use my fingers to smooth it out 
originally and then I'll go over it with a brush that's always got some Mod Podge on it and smooth it out and get out any wrinkles. If you want a full tutorial on how I print on tissue paper, that is linked down in my description box. This will be available as a free printable on my website. I created this last year sometime and I've used it a couple of times on different projects. So you may have to scroll down towards the bottom to find it, but I believe it is titled Farm Fresh Milk. So you can just go ahead and type that into the search button on my website and you'll be able to find it. This next thrift flip is using the green and orange pitcher. Look at that. Oh my gosh, it definitely needs a makeover. I don't even know if it would have been in style at any time, but that's just my opinion. Again, just to let you know, it got two coats of white spray paint and two coats of white chalk paint. And that is the best way that I have found to save on your chalk paint and make sure that the paint is going to stick to your project. Look at the difference on this one right away. I can't believe how beautiful it looks, just even solid white. So this second way of how I'm going to transfer images is to use these rub-on transfers from the Dollar Tree. Now, my Dollar Trees usually don't get that many designs of the rub-on transfers. Like I see all of you wonderful people in the United States, you get lots more options. This one is one of the fashion rub-on transfer designs and what I'm doing here is just cutting out the necklace and that is going to be the very top of my picture here. I thought this would look really pretty in a bathroom, perhaps on a vanity table or in a bedroom and you could change out the flowers seasonally. So that's my plan for this picture. If you are not familiar with how rub-on transfers work, you simply place the image down onto your object and you hold it very securely with one or two fingers if it's a larger one. And then you take some type of plastic object. I'm just using this plastic scraper, but you can use a Cricut scraper, you can use a credit card, something that is a little softer and not too sharp. And what you wanna do is just keep rubbing until you see that transfer lift away from the plastic and you can tell that when the plastic becomes a little bit more see-through meaning you'll be able to see it lift away from the transfer just make sure that your transfer is completely down on your project because sometimes these little rub-on transfers leave little edges so that's why I just tapped it a little bit with my finger Putting flat transfers on a rounded object can sometimes be a little tricky. So what I like to do is just start at the top and you can see I'm holding my thumb towards the top of the transfer to hold it down. And then once I have that whole area complete, then I'm going to go ahead and move my thumb down, just pushing on where I need it to go be on. You're not going to be able to lay out a flat transfer on a round object all at once. So just be patient and work with it until you get it on there. Now I'm going to take another sheet of the Dollar Tree transfers, the one that has the lettering that you can see there, sorry for the glare, but it has a bunch of different floral designs on it as well. And these I think are mostly laurel leaves and that's my favorite thing to work with. So I'm going to be cutting out little bits of these and placing them in between and around and making one big beautiful transfer. So don't be afraid of taking different pieces from these transfers just because they are on the page a certain way doesn't mean that that's how you have to use them. For the last canister that I'm going to do, I will be working with these clear stamps that I picked up at the Dollar Tree. I've also got some other stamps from different 
stores and I've also got some rubber stamps from Michaels that I'll use for this project. What I do is I open up the stamps, I take off the protective cover, but I leave them stuck on their backing sheet. That just makes it so much easier to work with and you don't have to worry about that stickiness coming off and wearing off eventually. With these being dollar store stamps, I want to preserve them for as long as I can. So all I'm going to do is take my scissors and cut the backing sheet, leaving the stamp on it. I like to make sure I have all my supplies at the ready. So I've got my stays on ink pad and I did get this from Amazon. And I've also got my stamp cleaning pad, which is the large sort of purpley black thing you see to the left. And I also have my stamp spritz. I find it's always easier to put the ink on the stamp while the stamp is laying down on the counter, but you may have a different way of doing it. And because this is a rounded area, you're not going to get full coverage on this. Sometimes it's going to get a little bit shaky, but you know what? You just have to go with it. I love things that look distressed. So if it's not a 100% perfect flower, I'm okay with that. As I'm working here, whenever I'm done with a stamp, I'm going to put it right on the cleaning area of my stamp cleaning pad. So the first circle down at the bottom is where I spritz the cleaner and then I just rub it on there and then I dry it at the top and that just makes sure that the ink comes off every time. For some other inks you can probably just leave it on and clean it at the end but I do find this stays on pigment ink dries really quickly and if you let it dry on your stamp you're not going to be able to get it off and that might eventually deter from all the details that you get with these stamps. I'm just going to continue stamping until I get the design I want. Now I ended up going on a bit of an angle. I didn't want it to be just plopped in the center so I wanted this to have a little bit of a different look. So I'm going to show you that now. I started angling the flowers sort of in the right direction, kind of going up and to the right. And then what I started to do is I really love it when you can see stamps or designs that kind of fall off the page or fall off the edge. So I decided to take some painter's tape and just take a small little piece and put it sort of in the direction of the line. So for this one, it's just up top there. I didn't want this to go any further than that. So I'm just going to go ahead and stamp just part of the flower. And then when I peel off the painter's tape, you're going to get a nice clean line, clean edge, and nothing's going to run over. Then I started using the painter's tape along the sides and that just allowed me to just go ahead and stamp the full flower whatever I needed to put on there and part of it would be on the tape so when I peel the tape off I'm going to get this beautiful nice clean edge and I really love how this one turned out. For the finishing touch on this canister, I decided to put the little hummingbird just on the one side. So I'm inking him up and I'm going to go ahead and place him down. Now, just as an aside, all of these canisters and pitchers got a good coat of Mod Podge to seal them up. But you could also use a spray sealer like Rust-Oleum Clear Matte Finish or any other type of sealer that you have. I found this garden stake windmill last year in the summertime at my dollar store and I'm just going to take it apart. I'm not going to be using the stakes for it. I just want the top windmill portion. I got a package of these spindles. I got 16 of them for 20 bucks and I thought that was a great buy off of Facebook Marketplace. But what I need to do with this is just cut it down a little wee bit. So I'm just going to use my miter box and my handsaw and go ahead and trim it down where I want it to be. 
I use 60 or 80 grit sandpaper a lot when I'm distressing because it makes quick work of getting down to the bare wood if that's what you want to do. And for this project, I definitely do. I want to get a lot of that bare wood showing through. I want this to look really old and weathered and it turned out perfect. My idea for this project is to have the windmill at the top of the spindle. So I'm drilling a hole all the way down through the spindle itself that's a little bit wider than the bolt I'm going to be using. So I'm just using a good amount of pressure here and getting through all the way nice and clean. This is a two by four that I'm gonna use for the base of this windmill. I did drill a hole into this as well, a little bit smaller than the size of screw that I'm using. And I'm making sure that as I screw this in, I leave a little bit on the other side. That's just going to make it easier for me to find the hole on the bottom of the spindle. And then I'll be able to screw these both together. Now I had to do that off screen because of course this is really tall but you can see here what I'm going to attempt to do. The two pieces are together really nice and secure so I'm just going to go around that two by four with some white chalk paint and give it a couple of coats so then I can distress that up a little bit later and it will match the spindle. In between working on the spindle I had taken this outside and given it a couple of coats of flat white spray paint. Now I'm taking a kitchen sponge which seems to be my most favorite way to distress things lately and I'm using some gray paint and I'm just going to be going around the edges a little bit. I want this to look like it's old and weathered and that some of the paint on the edges is starting to come off. Then I just put everything together and it spins. I was so excited that it actually spins. So this would look beautiful on a front porch or in a garden, but I will be keeping this in the house. And since I've got 15 more spindles, I'll be on the hunt for more of these windmill pieces. I'm going to start this project by gluing these two pieces together. This is just a two by four that's been cut square and this is a spindle from a bed. I had already painted it for a different project but now I'm going to repurpose it for this one. I'm using my favorite weld bond glue to glue these together. It holds within about 10 minutes. It needs about 24 hours to cure completely. It's really important to prep any pieces that you want to paint, especially if they're shiny. I like to use Rust-Oleum Matte Clear Finish, so I'm going to give this canister one spray all the way around, and that's just going to help my chalk paint grip better. I'll do the lid too. I purchased a new color of paint. This is the Folk Art Home Decor Chalk Paint in the color Sheepskin. It's a creamy white color. It's really pretty. And I got that instead of getting another chiffon cream, which I love, and that's by Rust-Oleum. But I thought I wanted to try something different. And I really love the coverage of the Folk Art Home Decor Chalk Paint. So I will have those listed down in my description box if you're interested in giving those paints a try. I'm going to give the 2x4 and the little spindle piece two coats of the sheepskin paint. Now that the clear matte finish is dry, I can also begin to start painting the canister. Now I'm starting with an up and down brushing motion because I know I'm going to have to do at least two to three coats on this. The stripes and the colors are fairly dark, so I want to make sure I get good coverage. But the reason I'm going up and down is I like to change the direction of my brush strokes with each coat, and that just ensures better coverage. I decided to put a grain sack stripe design on the canister and I've already done one of the thin stripes and I'm just putting the painter's tape on to get ready to paint the second stripe. I'm just using a paintbrush and a very light touch. I'm using a medium gray chalk paint and I'm just going to make sure that I cover it well the first time. I'm not going to do two coats so if a little bit of that bottom color shows through that'll look great. 
once I'm done painting, I remove the tape right away because I don't want any of that tape to hang on to the gray paint and then pull it off when it's dry. So it's always a good idea to remove your painter's tape when the paint is still wet. Once the two thin stripes were completely dry, I reapplied the tape and did the thicker stripe in the center. Now I'm taking a small paintbrush and just hand painting number and two with a period in between. And I think that just adds to the farmhouse charm of this canister. If you're not good at doing hand painting, you could definitely use stickers or a Cricut or any rub-on transfers that you can find. I'm just dry brushing a little bit of the sheepskin paint over the lettering and the stripes just so they look a little bit aged as well. I'm also going to be dry brushing the bottom part. I'm going to leave the canister without any dry brushing but I thought to bring all of the colors together it would be a good idea to add a little bit of gray to the 2x4 and the spindle. Now it's time to glue everything together and of course using my weld bond glue one more time I'm going to make sure that I get a decent amount on the spindle and then I'll center it onto my canister and let that set overnight. I already redid this chicken canister a while ago and if you're following me and watching my videos you probably remember when I did this. I've decided to remake him one more time because I just really didn't like the gray and the dark colors of him. So I'm using my regular DIY chalk paint in white and I'm going to give him one coat for now. After the first coat was dry, I decided to glue him together. I will never use this as a cookie jar or a canister. I just wanted it to be decor. So I'm using hot glue and I'm going to glue the two pieces together. And then I'm going to take some of my dry decks spackle and fill in the crack so you don't even know that it was there. I like to use a popsicle stick to apply the spackle and my favorite brand to use is Drydex. This is the one that is pink and then when it's white it, you know it's completely dry. I took some of that same medium gray color and a chip brush and just dry brushed all around the chicken bringing out all of those details and I think this looks absolutely amazing. So much better than the dark color it was before. My first project for you today needs some dark gray chalk paint, which I am totally out of, but I have lots of black paint and I have lots of white paint. I buy them in gallons right off the shelf at my hardware stores. The black is from Walmart and it's called Black Onyx. This is an eggshell finish. And the white one is a flat white finish. Also, like I said, ready to buy right off the shelf. I mix my colors in a glass jar. I'm always washing out my glass jar and keeping them and I'm doing about a half and half ratio here. The nice thing about mixing your own paints is that you can get the color you want. You don't have to just be limited as to what is out in the stores. I've got my paint stir stick and I am stirring the heck out of it and in a few minutes I'm going to pick it up and start shaking the bejeebies out of it. To make this a chalk paint, I'm adding some talc. This talc is from Johnson & Johnson. It's their baby powder version. I've had these for a few years. I know they no longer sell it because of the properties in the talc, but I stocked up, so I still have some. There are some other options available on Amazon. If I can find them, I'll link them down in my description box. You'll want to stir it up as best you can and then give it a really good shake again until you don't have any more lumps in it. 
I'm going to be painting this urn that you see here in the corner. You'll see it better in a second. I want to give it a concrete look. It's a really funky turquoise color, but it has some beautiful lines in it and design. So I'm taking some baking soda and I'm mixing it in with my newly made chalk paint. Now this turns out pretty thick because the chalk paint that I made is also very thick. So I do add a little bit of water just to thin it out so it's easier to work with. When I do this type of technique using the baking soda in the chalk paint, I like to use a stippling brush and this one is fairly rough. I love it for this because not only does the baking soda give it texture, but the stippling also gives it texture. I'm going to make sure I get in all of the grooves and all of these cracks and crevices and make sure that you don't see any of that green. Although at one point I thought it would be really cool to put some bronze paint on this and make it look like aged copper but that's not really my style so I'm headed back to the concrete. Now that the urn is dry I'm taking the same brush with some white chalk paint and I'm going to go all over it heavier in some spots lighter in other spots but it's all going to get a little touch of white. Now I'm going to start making the tree. This is a branch that I got from my lilac bush in the backyard and these stems I got at Walmart a while ago and they've been waiting for the right pot to come along and I finally was able to grab one. I'm taking my drill and with a bit that's a little bit bigger than the stems I'm putting some holes in the branch. I want to be able to set those stems right in the branch so they look like they're growing out. This one that I'm doing is on a bit of an angle and that will just help to make it look more realistic. I'm just going to use hot glue. I'm going to put some right inside each of the holes and then push the stem in and hold it there until the glue has a chance to dry. This turns out really good. I did this with a lemon tree a while ago for some summer decor and it's just a really fun way to make a fabulous looking tree. It may be hard for you to tell but I'm making sure that I'm putting the branches in face up as you see me doing here. I don't want the colored parts to be looking down. I want the colored parts to be looking up because that's naturally how a tree would grow. I'm adding a few more holes down towards the bottom of the tree and then I'll just continue adding branches and stems until I'm happy with what it looks like. The other thing I do for these trees is keep spinning it around and making sure that it looks good from all angles because of course it's a tree. It's not going to be hanging on a wall. It's going to be standing up somewhere and it needs to look good from all angles. This urn wasn't very heavy. It's actually resin so it's kind of lightweight but I decided to put some pea gravel down at the bottom just to give it a little bit of extra weight so it doesn't topple over. I'm going to be using a pool noodle right in the center because it's got the perfect hole where I can put the tree trunk and then I'm going to be cutting up a little bit more pool noodle to wedge in all around the side and make sure that it's nice and secure in there. Then I simply pushed the stem right inside the pool noodle, added a little bit of hot glue and some reindeer moss to cover up the pool noodle. And this olive tree is complete and absolutely stunning. My second project is this organizer. It's wooden that I've had for a couple of years. I painted it white before, as you can see. I put some words on it, didn't like it. It sat in the closet for a couple of years. So now it's time to make it look much prettier than it already does. Using some sandpaper and my block, I'm just going to get rid of as much of this Craft Smart paint pen words that's on there, and then I'll wipe it down really well. I'm going to use Martha Stewart Vintage Decor Chalk Paint in the color Eucalyptus. This is a beautiful green color and I thought it would be really great as a base coat for what my plan is. So I'm going to give it one really good coat. This chalk paint 
covers really well. It's super thick and it really only needed a little bit of a touch up as a second coat. I have been loving this candle wax distressing technique. So I thought I would give it a shot on this. I'm going to just go all over it. It's not all going to be coming off, just some of it. But I just kind of went to town covering every little bit of this with some wax. Now I'm giving it just one really good coat of my DIY white chalk paint because it's going to be a distressed piece so it doesn't have to have a really awesome coverage. I just wanted to make sure that there weren't any green spots showing through. Once the paint was completely dry, I'm using my Pampered Chef scraper. It's just a piece of plastic, so if you have a credit card or another type of scraper, please don't use your Cricut scraper because it's way too expensive to use for this. You just go ahead and scrape off as much of the white paint as you want. It's really personal preference. For this one, I actually wanted quite a bit of the paint to come off to show that beautiful green color underneath. Look at this gorgeous napkin that I got from my Dollarama store. Absolutely beautiful. Look at all those wonderful succulents. I'm going to be using this as a decoupage paper. So I'm going to peel off the two layers of white underneath. You can see I'm having a pretty difficult time trying to find that corner, but when you do get it, they come off pretty easily. Using these tiny little scissors that I got at the Dollar Tree, I'm going to cut out each of the succulents that I want, making sure that I get all of the shapes cut out really well. So I'm going to be using probably six to eight of these little succulents on my project. I'm going to use Mod Podge and I'm going to start in the center of the very front. I'm also going to go over the lip a bit because I want those little succulents to kind of fold over the top edge. I think that's going to give it more of a high end look. I always use my brush to pick up small pieces like this because it gives me more control of how I'm going to be placing it. Then I'm going to make sure that my brush is always a little bit wet with the Mod Podge because that's the best way to prevent any tearing of your paper. These are really thin papers just like tissue paper and you don't want it to tear. It also makes sure that you don't have that many wrinkles. I actually hardly got any wrinkles at all using this type of napkin. So I don't know if it was the napkin or the way I did it, I'm not really sure. But anyhow, I'm just gonna continue adding the succulents along the row at the bottom here. I think I'm going to be ending up adding about six of them or seven of them down here. I'm going to add two to the next level and then I'll add one at the very top. Since this is probably going to be standing on a table or a desk, it might be against a wall, but you never know. I decided to add one more succulent right to the middle in the back. I'm really loving that distressing technique. This one is absolutely gorgeous. Today I've got a couple of thrift store flips for you and I'm starting off with this what I think is a pantry box. It was $3.99 at Value Village and it has this felt lid that I think was meant to possibly absorb some of the moisture and keep things fresh. Well it's handmade but not my style so I'm going to go ahead and use my Rust-Oleum chalk paint in linen white and give it a couple of nice coats. I'm not going to do the interior right now because I'm going to be doing that a different color. I've been using folk art home decor chalk paint lately and I really love the texture of it and it covers in one coat really well. So I'm going to use this to paint the complete interior, the bottom and the sides of this box. I wanted to add some handles for a little bit more of a farmhouse look so I'm just using my cordless drill with the largest drill bit that I have I believe this is about a quarter of an inch and I just drilled two holes on either side and then on both sides of the box. 
I'm using some of this white rope that I got at Michael's on a big spool. I'm putting some scotch tape at the end of the rope so it's easier to feed it through the hole and then I'm going to simply tie a knot on the inside. This is a vinyl cutout from My Cricut Joy and this is the first time I'm using vinyl as a stencil. I have to be honest with you, I didn't like the process. It was really long and I probably won't do it again. I'll probably stick to using either decals or I'll cut out a stencil on either the plastic or some uh, cardstock and that will be the easiest thing to do. There was just way too many steps to get this vinyl created onto my project. Although when I was completed and done with it, I think it turns out absolutely gorgeous. So I've peeled off the transfer tape and here is my stencil. I'm using a makeup sponge and Maui sand chalk paint from Folk Art. It's a dark charcoal gray. And I'm going to make sure that I get all of the letters really well. One thing that I really like about using a stencil vinyl is that you won't get hardly any bleed through, especially if you make sure that it's stuck down really well. So my letters come out really pretty and there's lots of crisp lines so this is something that I did enjoy even though making it was a pain in the butt. Now I'm just peeling off the vinyl stencil and these things grip like the dickens so you have to be really careful and I was crossing my fingers the whole time that it wouldn't pull off too much of the paint but you can see all the vinyl that's being left behind I'm gonna have to take my little weeding tool and weed all of that off so that's another step to getting this stencil created I love how it turned out but it was a lot of work Using some fine grit sandpaper, I'm just going to go around the top and bottom edges to bring out some of that wood look to make it look a little bit more rustic and used. I'm also going to take the sandpaper across the letters very gently just to give them a little bit more of a faded look, although I really liked how crisp they were, but it really makes it look a lot more authentic and vintage if it's a little bit faded in the lettering. I'm using a distressing technique that I found a while ago. I only use this for wood and what I'm doing is taking a screwdriver and actually scraping off some pieces of the paint so I can get down to the bare wood. When I use sandpaper, it ends up scuffing all of the paint around where I want it distressed and I didn't like that look. So I figured out that this is a good way to just literally get the marks where you want them and the rest of the paint around the areas won't get too scuffed up. I really love how this project turned out and I'm actually going to keep all of my little pieces of fabric and yarn and different things that I need for crafting in it. Project number two is this Lazy Susan. I'm always on the lookout for these because they are really good sellers. I'm going to take some tape and mask off some stripes and it's really easy to get it straight because the wood grain on this, the sections, you can see them are straight across as well. My go-to chalk paint for white is Linen White from Rust-Oleum. I really love the color of it. It has actually more of a gray white tone to it, so it's really pretty. But I've also been using the Folk Art White Adirondack, and I like that one too. The texture and the thickness of that paint just lets you cover all in one coat and it's really good but the linen white works really well too. I am going to go around the edges a little bit. I'm not going to do underneath at this time but I will be cleaning the bottom up later when everything is dry. The second color I used for the bottom was Maui Sand by Folk Art. It's a little bit of a dark gray color and I forgot to hit the record button when I was painting that, but you get the idea. Anyway, I'm going to take the tape off and then I'm just going to let it dry before I move on to the next step. 
I'm using this Americana gel stain in the color Walnut and it goes on really nicely. I'm using a really rough brush because I want to get the effect of wood grain and I'm going to go ahead and just apply that to the whole strip. To make the lines in between all the colors stand out, I'm using my Craftsmart paint pen in the color black and a ruler and I'm just going to draw a line right where all of the colors meet just to make it a little bit more crisp. Using some black paint and my chip brush, I'm just putting a small amount of distressing on the gray and the white and I'm going to just hit the edges a little bit too just to make them look a little bit more distressed. I'm going to give this a sealer with polycrylic. It's a crystal clear finish and it's in a matte shine. So I really like this one. It works really well. One tip I can give you is to make sure that you let your project cure for 24 hours before you start putting the sealer on. I have had instances where I haven't waited long enough and the sealer reactivated the chalk paint and pulled some of it off. It happens especially with stains like this stain in the center here. I would have to wait till that's fully hardened before I put a sealer on top because otherwise I'll just end up pulling all of that stain right back up again. Because that's a water-based stain and it's just kind of sitting on top right now, it didn't actually penetrate the wood. So it's different if you're sanding things down and you're making sure that the stain can get all the way through, but that's just a tip that I learned that I wanted to share. Hi there, Sandra here from the Schwoven's Nest. Thanks for stopping in today. I have always been a country girl at heart, although I've always lived my life in the city. And so I'm in love with farmhouse decor and I love to share my passion with the world. So you will find a lot of thrift store flips with wood products on my channel in a farmhouse decor style. This wooden crate is made out of pine and it's super heavy. This is something that has been in my home for a really long time. It was a thrift store find years ago. It ended up just being buried in the basement and I thought, you know what, it is time to pull it out and start making it look like something I would love to have in my home instead of hiding it in the basement. The color that I'm using here is an old mist tint of paint that I picked up for $8 at a hardware store and I haven't used it yet. I've had it for a while as well, but I decided to break out this color. It's sort of a beigey gray and it's just a latex paint, but I'm going to be doing some other treatments to this crate to make it look old and vintage. I just gave this one coat and this is the color. It's a nice color, I like it, but I would never leave it this way. So I'm going to use some coarse grit sandpaper and just rough up all the edges and the sides, get a little of the regular wood showing through, but then the next step is really gonna bring out the sanding marks that I'm doing here. I'm using Bare Dark Wax, and this is something that I've had for a little bit. I've tried it on a few projects, and I really do like the way it looks. I'm using a soft rag and I'm grabbing quite a bit of the wax because I want this to look old and dirty and antiqued and that's exactly what the wax is supposed to do. So here's what it looks like antiqued with the brown wax, but I'm gonna take it a step further and I'm going to use some black chalk paint and dry brush over it, make it even more dirty, more vintage, more old looking, and to bring out a little bit more of some of the grain in the wood. I'm going to be using a couple of Jilly Bean Soup stencils that I got from Joanne Fabric and Crafts, the link to that is down in my description box. And this one says farm fresh eggs laid daily, but 
The stencil is a really long. You can see at the top of the screen that the laid daily is hanging right off the crate. So I'm just moving the stencil around and placing it in a way that everything is going to fit. So just because you have a big stencil doesn't mean you have to put it on the way it is on the stencil. You can move the stencil around and fit it into whatever size area you have. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm taking the chicken and moving it over to the other side of the crate because I want to have the chicken on it, but it just isn't going to fit on this size of crate. So I'm going to do the same thing with my makeup sponge and my DIY black chalk paint. Now I'm going to be stenciling the words laid daily right underneath the farm fresh eggs towards the bottom. And now I've got the whole stencil on my crate, but just not in the exact form that the stencil is in. On the other side of the crate, I'm going to use fresh produce locally grown. The fresh is going to be on the top slot of the crate and then produce and locally grown. I'm going to move the stencil down and make it fit on the bottom slot of the crate. Basically the same idea as I did for the first side of the crate. I'm moving the stencil around to make it fit the space I have. For my projects, I like to use this Minwax water-based polycrylic. It's a protective finish and I always get the clear matte. I don't want any gloss or anything on my projects. I'm also going to use a brand new brush. And when I'm done with this brush, I'm going to actually label it with my label maker and I'm going to put polycrylic on the handle so I know that this is the brush that I will always use for my top coats. Here's a look at how my crate turned out. I just adore it. And the person that I'm gifting it to has seen it just in a picture and she loves it too. This is the thrift store piece that I am going to flip today. When I saw it at the thrift store, I fell in love. I think it's the cutest little thing. It's wood, it's iron, it's farmhouse, it's rustic. And I just thought it would be the perfect item for this flip today. I'm planning on using this or having someone use this as an outdoor piece. So I decided to use flat white trim clad rust paint, which is an exterior paint. It's oil based and it will definitely stand the test of time. I started off using a foam brush and I'm doing the interior first because I'm really good at painting the outside of things. And then when I paint the inside, I just get totally covered with paint. And because this is oil based, it takes a little bit more effort to get it off of your skin. So I thought I would try and be smart this time. So partway through, I decided to switch to just a really old, cheap paintbrush. Um, the foam brush wasn't working. It just was bending too much and it was taking me too long to get things painted and covered nicely. So just using this old brush that I can just toss when I'm finished was perfect. I just really love how bright and cheerful this is starting to look. And as I was going, I decided that I was not going to paint the ironwork white. Some of it ended up getting painted white. As you can see, there's some sections there and I'm actually doing it right now, but I did change my mind and decided to do the iron in a different color. So here's two coats of the white as a little bit of the wood is still showing through, but that's okay. It gives it a little bit of a rustic feel. And now I'm using a small paintbrush and again, the trim pad paint in flat black to paint all of the ironwork. Just recently, I paid a visit to the Habitat for Humanity Restore and picked up this spindle for $2. I'm going to trim the end of it off and there's a reason I'm doing that. I want to have a solar light on the top of the spindle, but I don't need it as tall as it is right now. So I'm just going to cut it in such a way that I can use the other piece for a different project. I'm going to use a half inch spade bit to drill a hole in the top of the spindle that is just the right size for the solar light to fit into. 
So here's the hole that I drilled at the top and it's just the perfect fit for the bottom part of the solar lantern. Before I glue it in, I'm going to paint the spindle white. Using some of the black paint, I just had this brush from a different project. So I'm just going over the white parts of this little basket to create a distressed look. I wanted it just to look a little bit more rustic. So here I am using my Weld Bond glue, my absolute favorite permanent glue. And I'm gonna put a big glob of it into the hole at the top of the spindle. This is where I'm going to insert the solar light. As I was doing this, I noticed that I did not have any footage for how I attached this dowel to the spindle, but I did it the same way. I used a half inch spade bit, I drilled a hole, then I put some glue in and pushed the dowel in and then painted it white. I'm using some wood screws and my cordless drill to attach the spindle to the back of the crate. So I'm gonna put a couple screws in at the back and then I'll put one in at the side just to keep it sturdy and secure. I want to create a little hanging sign for the dowel. So I'm using this sign that I picked up at Dollarama last fall and I'm just cutting off one of the pieces. I used my DIY black chalk paint to give this a couple coats front and back. Here you can see I've got an S hook and an I hook. This S hook was from a sign that I picked up at the Dollar Tree. It was those little windmill signs with the welcome underneath. I had two of them and I always keep hardware when I'm using signs and taking the hardware off. So I've attached these two together and now I'm just screwing that I hook right into the top side of the sign. Using my very favorite CraftSmart paint pen in white, I'm going to just freehand the word welcome. Normally when I freehand my letters, I start in the center and work my way to the front of the word and then to the back of the word. And that just ensures that I do things evenly. For this one, I didn't do that. I'm not quite sure why, but it tended to work out anyway. I was really happy with the outcome. So here's the word and then I'm just going to make it a little bit thicker and add a little bit of a cutesy look to it. To give the letters a little bit more dimension, I'm taking this white marker and just drawing a thin line on the outside of each letter and then I'm going to come back and draw another thin line on the inside of each letter. It just makes it look a little bit more three-dimensional and just a little bit extra character. My first project for you is this calendar holder. These were really popular in the 80s and the 90s. You hung them on your wall and every year you purchased a new calendar to fit right inside the slot. This was only $2 at the thrift store. It's been in my stash for a while waiting for a makeover and I figured now is the time to do something with it. Unfortunately, it has this wooden pineapple stuck to it and it was really stuck. I tried all sorts of things to get it off. First, my paint scraper couldn't make a dent in that. Then I tried my craft knife to try and cut some of the glue or wood away that was underneath. And eventually I just ended up using my hacksaw and cut it off, but it did end up leaving quite a bit of a hole because it just kind of popped off and took some of the original wood with it. But no worries, I'm just grabbing my spackle and filling up that hole to make it nice and smooth. What I'm doing here is filling in the gap between the backing and the wood on the top side of the 
calendar. There needed to be a space where you could slip your calendar in, but when you just look at it from the front, you can see that gap. So I'm using some of these little wood shims that I picked up at the Home Depot in a pack of 40. I like to use these. They're really easy just to score with a utility knife and then they'll just snap in half. If you're at all familiar with shims, they are thicker on one end and thinner on the other end. So I did need to cut another smaller piece and fit it into the back. I ended up using some hot glue to hold them down and then I used some little tack nails to hold them in place permanently. Once I had that completed, I just sanded some of the spackle down just to get the edges and everything nice and smooth. And then I'm going to give it two coats of Rust-Oleum Linen White Chalk Paint. I'm using a Bennett Round Chalk Paint Brush. And when I'm doing projects like this where I don't want brush strokes, I use my chalk paint brushes. And I really love them because the paint goes on so nice and smooth and you really get good coverage. I'm going to put a stencil on the bottom half of the calendar and I've decided to use this Home Sweet Home stencil from Jilly Bean Stencils available at Joanne Fabrics. I will put a link in my description box for the pack. I believe there was about 20 of them all together. They are a thick paper stencil these can't be cleaned too much. The paint dries fairly quickly on them, but I think in the long run, it's going to be an advantage because some of the little pieces of the stencil tend to pop up. And if there's some paint on them, they'll probably be a little bit more durable. I'm using Rust-Oleum charcoal chalk paint and a makeup sponge to apply the paint onto the sign. There's a couple of things to remember when you're working with stencils. The first is you don't want to load too much paint onto your sponge or brush. So as you can see, I'm dipping my paint into the lid and then I'm dabbing some of the paint off into this little plate. The second thing you want to do is use a dabbing motion and vertical. So an up and down motion, not a side to side. You're not painting it on, you're dabbing it on. I haven't done a reveal for you guys in a really long time. So here we go. This is time for the reveal. The stencil turned out perfectly. I'm so happy with it and I don't have any bleeding at all. The top half of the sign is going to have a removable wreath. And what I mean by that is you're going to be able to take the wreath off and change it for the seasons. I'm starting off by trimming some of this green hydrangea flower and I'm just going to be using some of the lighter green blossoms. I'm going to use hot glue to make sure that they stay on properly. These stems are really flimsy so I'm going to just kind of twist it into this grapevine wreath form that I'm starting out with and then use some hot glue to hold the flowers in place. The second part of the wreath is to use some lavender blossoms. I'm just trimming these down just a little bit because they were just a bit too long and then I'll use some hot glue as well and I'm going to be putting these in a circle all the way around and all of the blooms will be going in the same direction. I'm also going to try to keep them evenly spaced and then I'll see how it looks when it's complete and if it needs a little bit more embellishment. I'm really loving how this wreath is coming together, but the single lavender blossoms were a little sparse. So I've decided to just double up on those. And so I'll do the same thing with another row all the way around again, following the same direction. To add a little bit more texture and color, I'm gonna take the ends of these lavender blossoms that I trimmed off and add those into the wreath. Again, still going in the same direction as the original lavender blooms, but I'll probably put them here and there just to kind of use them as a filler. It 
it's a farmhouse sign, I've got to do some distressing. I'm taking some 220 grit sandpaper and just going over the edges and wherever I feel there would have been some natural wear to bring out some of the wood. These are my favorite command hooks to use. They're really small and inconspicuous, but the hook part is really nice and large so a wreath can hang on it really nicely. I just need to find where it's going to look best and then I'll be able to attach the command hook to the top portion of the calendar frame and that will give the person who's going to own this eventually to be able to switch out wreaths for the seasons. If you're not familiar with how command hooks work, they're actually very easy. Each of them comes with a double-sided piece of tape and it's not really tape but that's what I call it. There's a black side which is the part for the wall and then there's a red side which is the part that goes on the hook. So I'm going to peel off the red side, I'll place it onto the hook, then I'll peel off the black side and place it on the mark on my calendar. The second project I have for you today is this raw wooden crate. I did take it outside already and gave it a little bit of a sanding. There were some rough edges on it. I just thought the shape of it was cute. Normally you would see rectangle crates, but this one was square, so I thought it was cute. I'm going to be painting it with just some latex paint. This is a color, it's called mushroom, and it's left over from when I painted my great room. I really like the color. It's very similar to Waverly chalk paint in mineral, I believe, but I'm just going to give this one coat because I have some other plans for it as well. I'm going to turn this crate into a vintage garden crate. I'm using these stencils that I picked up at a dollar store a couple of years ago, and I'm just going to cut the letters in half and then pop out the insides. I'm going to use the charcoal Rust-Oleum chalk paint color and the makeup sponge to apply the paint to the stencils. I'm going to put lettering on all four sides of this crate. This side will have the word herbs on it and the other side is going to have seeds and then I'm going to put something different on the slatted sides. I'm also going to add a couple of hand lettered words. On the top I'm going to put organic and local on the bottom. And when I do my hand lettering, I always start in the center of the word. So A was the middle letter and that's where I started and then I work my way forwards and then backwards. That usually helps me to get the word more centered, but as you can see, I'm a little off today. I think it'll look okay once I've got everything complete. I'm always seeing some vintage crates with the labels kind of off kilter a little bit, so I'm not too worried about that. To make the crate look even more distressed, I'm just going to sand down the words a little bit and then I'm going to use bare dark wax and I like to apply the wax with a soft rag. I usually use an old t-shirt and I'm just going to layer it a few different times just to make sure I get the color I want. The last thing I'm going to do is take that makeup sponge that I used to apply the stencils. I'm going to add a little bit of the charcoal chalk paint every once in a while and I'm just rubbing that makeup sponge all the way across in a few spots just to give it more of a dirty and scuffed up look. On the opposite sides of the herbs and seeds words, I stenciled in the number four, just using a few of the different sizes of stencils that I have in the same type of design.
If you are new to my channel and you like what you see, I would love for you to hit that red subscribe button and the bell to get notified when I upload new content. Thank you so much for watching and I really appreciate your support. Have a great day.